I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Deirdre Madeline Smith uh, for inviting me to give a guest lecture in uh, the, the, her class, The Ready Made and Its Legacies. Um, I wish I could have visited uh, Austin, the University of Boston at Texas. Uh, I've always wanted to visit Austin, but <laughs> clearly um, we're not in a position to be traveling very much these days. And so I hope this remote, uh, this remote talk, this remote lecture, which is going to be part of our, our in-class discussion, uh, will, will prove to be interesting. Um, so this is a, a paper that is fledgling that I'm, that I'm working on. So this is some new material um, that I'm, that I'm going to present. Uh, I'm going to more or less read the, read the paper, um, but I'll give some asides here and there uh, to, to sort of break, uh, break the monotony. Um, so why don't we go ahead and, and get started? So a key moment in Unlocking the Cage, the 2016 documentary film about the non-human rights project, comes when the animal rights lawyer Stephen Wise asserts in his argument before the New York Court of Appeals that Tommy, the chimpanzee he's representing, is a person. One of the judges quickly cuts him off and says, you say he's a person, we haven't decided that. Though she arguably subverts herself by calling Tommy a he and not it, the judge personifies the sovereignty of the law that wields power over life as a juridical category. This telling moment also leads to an interesting question about personhood, which is central to Wise's legal recourse to writ of habeas corpus. Is personhood a top-down legal category only to be conferred through institutional performance speech acts, amounting to a legal baptism, or is personhood a bottom-up biological category formed by evolutionary givenness on a creaturely timescale, a timescale that gradually brought rise to autonomous, autonomous movement, sentience, consciousness, and neural complexity, all of which ultimately led to our ability to confer rights, hold courts, and create legal concepts in the first place. Put more simply, the question of creation is at play here. Did we create personhood, or did personhood create us, allowing us to subsequently name it retroactively? Contrary to the common sense notion of being a person, personhood as a legal construct is not a biological reality. It's an abstract entity with the capacity for having rights. This includes human beings, and since the 19th century, ships and corporations. But has the legal concept of personhood really erased all its biological tracks? Are not the positive and negative rights inherent to this legal construct fundamentally creaturely, human and non-human? Is not this embodied creaturely condition our ambling and vulnerable path along evolutionary history, a very precondition for the retroactive conceptualization of safety, rights, and personhood? I posit from the start that personhood is forever haunted by the biological imminence of animality on this planet. Yet in this talk, I'll, I'll be keeping my understanding of personhood somewhat loose, befitting the plasticity of, his def of its definitional contours, which is what makes some lawyers, philosophers, and activists optimistic about its le legal application for the protection of certain non-human animals. I'll also focus my energies less on personhood in isolation and more on its comparative collision with a concept that will be unfamiliar to legal scholars, but very familiar to art historians, the ready-made. Some interesting things happen when personhood and the ready-made are placed side by side. It would, appear, it would appear at first that they have little in common, after all, the first is an autonomous and singular entity deemed to be a person, while the second is an object and generalizable piece of property deemed to be an artwork. A pertinent example from art history will make this clear. Marcel Duchamp was a legal person who had certain rights predicated on his singular autonomy, while his fountain, a white porcelain urinal proffered by him as a work of art for the Society of Independent Artists in 1917, was neither autonomous nor singular. It could have been in any plumbing store at the time, and that was the point of Duchamp's anti-aesthetic instigation. And yet, there are a number of ways in which personhood and the ready-made hold strange affinities. Both involve strategies of generic naming, in one case as art, in the other as legal person. Both institutionalize their entities, determining official standing and treatment. An object or performance is just an object or action, when situated outside the institutional codifications of the art world. Similarly, in not being considered persons, non-human animals fall outside the protective powers of rights and legal protection and are relegated to non-persons in purported bare life. 
Though I agree with Alexander uh, Wahaile when he writes that there's no such thing as an absolute bio biopolitical substance, be it racialized or animalized. Finally, both amount to philosophical process of epistemological and even ontological structuring and naturalization. The very being of the entity in question, be it an artwork or a person, is received and perceived differently according to the terms and institutions that wield power over that entity. There's a symbolic thickness that alters the real, magically, in what Colin Dayan has called rituals of definition. Courts and museums hold this in common. But what happens when a ready-made uh, fits certain criterion for personhood? In light of recent scientific discoveries concerning non-human minds and personalities, it now appears that any time animals have been treated as ready-made objects, this has amounted to a collapse of personhood and the ready-made, sending both into categorical crisis. This is what I call the problem of the animal ready-made. By being outside the laws of humanist sovereignty, animals have been consigned to property status. This has facilitated their mass breeding and intensive exploitation. And yet, as they begin to emerge from the mass industrial fog of the past two centuries as creatures with propensities for autonomy, individuality, kinship, and inimitable memory, we're having more and more trouble seeing them as interchangeable commodity objects. In short, a urinal is a urinal is a urinal, but a cow is not a cow is not a cow. The paradox of the animal ready-made is nicely illustrated by Marcel Bretaille's Les Animaux de la Ferme, or The Animals of the Farm, from 1974. And here what we're seeing um, essentially is a, a, an example of an assisted ready-made, a ready-made poster that he took and then, and then altered, as I'll tell you in a moment. The work is nearly identical to a 19th century print depicting domestic cow breeds in taxonomic profile, save for a surreptitious change in captioning by the artist. Instead of types of cows, like vache picard, vache comtoise, vache flamande, which appeared on the original print, the name underneath each animal has now been changed to makes of cars, Chevrolet, Cadillac, Chrysler, etc. Thus, on the one hand, the work on, opens onto the history of animals as reducible to assembly line objects, like cars, which they de facto became beginning with the Cincinnati and Chicago meatpacking plants of the 19th century which would indeed uh, go on to influence the subsequent development of Fordism and the, uh, and the automotive assembly line. On the other hand, in becoming incorporated, at least nominally, the cows have attained the potential for personhood, since corporations can and have been considered to be persons in the legal sense. In the first instance, biological singularity bearing on personhood is erased and disavowed along the endless dismembering of the, dis of the disassembly line, while well, in the second, personhood becomes available not based on appeals to corporeality, sentience, or mindedness, but in the legal rights of corporate identity. The irony should be pretty clear. Andy Warhol provides us a slightly different perspective. Um, and I know you're all coming from uh, fresh off of a, of a session on, on pop art, so this is a nice, a nice moment to, to tie into that. A good portion of the, of the research for this talk was done at MoMA's libraries and, and archives in, in, in New York. And each time I would visit uh, the, the library, I'd walk by the stairs that had Warhol's cow, pa cow, uh, cow wallpaper plastered on the wall of the museum's education wing. And here we have a very different work on paper where the material itself points towards mass decorative production. Here we have, it would seem, cow after cow after cow, but actually this is not a sea of undifferentiated cow, but cows, but one solitary cow. Everything but the animal is standardized in identical repeatability. The source photograph, the silk screens, the colors, the wallpaper, but not the cow, which remains stubbornly singular, even in her multiplicity. That, this, that, it, that it is immediately apparent Marilyn Monroe is a unique individual in Warhol's work, where she is similarly repeated in his silk screen reproductions, uh, whereas with this cow, it probably has to be pointed out says something about the ways we've been conditioned to see non-human so-called food animals as purely interchangeable. So in both Brotires as in Warhol's work, we have the push and pull between standardization and the rendering general of life, which are prerequisites for the animal to be ready mateable, and creaturely singularity and irreplaceability, which uneasily point more towards the category of personhood than industrial commodity making. Legally, all these cows fall under property law, 
but existentially, as living creatures, they exceed such legal reductiveness. In placing the ready-made and personhood side by side, it becomes clear that we're dealing with parallel histories of deregulation, one aesthetic, the other legal. As is well known, Duchamp's fountain sent the art world into a crisis of ontological identity. If a urinal can be art, then what else can be art? And over the course of the 20th century, as Thierry de Deuve has argued, the answer became well, anything whatever, including non-human animals. So Duchamp's original instigation to force a reckoning of, of art's rituals of definition became a thoroughgoing deregulation of what art could be in the first place. And it's little noted that the ready-made is something of a politically ambivalent strategy. While it can and certainly has been a creative and liberatory instigation, we also have to admit that it befits all too nicely with neoliberal economic models, where not everything can be art, but everything can be commodified and privatized, including art and its institutions. Here, neoliberal capitalism has likely had the last laugh over any transgression, transgressive conception of the ready-made. It, it was the poet um, Arthur Rimbaud who first used the concept of deregulation in his poetry, and as Franco B. Foberardi has demonstrated, this impulse leads to uncomfortably uh, this, this impulse leads uncomfortably to a neoliberal view of economic de deregulation, which has led to all sorts of deleterious spe speculation, uh, and maybe most pertinently for this talk, uh, speculation on the more than human world, um, the environment, ecology, um, and, and animals. Concurrently, and, and especially in the last few decades, we've seen a deregulation of personhood, which might trouble this economic speculation. Courts around the world have begun amending their laws to consider non-human subjectivity, however selective and modest. So, for example, in 2014, the French legal system updated the Napoleonic civic, uh, Civil Code by decreeing that sentient living beings, animals exceed the legal status of furniture, though they didn't go so far as to decree them to be legal persons. Um, and in a legal first in 2016, a chimpanzee uh, in Argentina in Argentina, uh, named Cecilia, uh, who was relocated to Brazil, became the first non-human animal to be granted the legal rights of personhood. But here is my crucial point, uh, which returns us to the unstable category of personhood as both legal category and living thing. Did non-human animals need this legal status update to become person-like entities? Or were they always already person-like beings in their evolutionary givenness of sentience, consciousness, and neural complexity. In this paper, I maintain the latter, and, and this will hold clear implications for retroactively reading the animal ready-made in art as confused and paradoxical. So let's go back to the source for a moment and ask the following two questions. Why did Duchamp never use an animal as a ready-made? And this being the case, what role does animality possibly play at the advent of this most famous historical avant-garde strategy? The short answer to the first question is that animals didn't yet appear on consumer shelves as undifferentiated commodities in uniform packaging, at least to the degree, to the degree they do so today. Though I think more research is needed here on the history of animal packaging and the scalability of animal bodies prior to the current factory farm model beginning in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and so here, I think there's a lot more research that needs to be done about the history of, of, of animal bodies and packaging and, and sort of the visual culture of their, their commodification, uh, because it, this actually could be pushed back. Unlike bicycle wheels, snow shovels, and urinals, an animals did not yet fully hold this appearance in consumer culture. Um, Eli Lothars, a surrealist, a photographer associated with the surrealists, uh, especially the Bataille strain of surrealism, Eli Lothar's slaughterhouse photographs from the late 1920s Paris show a transition period. Located in La Viette in Paris, uh, butchering and rendering animal bodies had not yet become fully invisible from public view. Blood and fat smears the streets, and the effective presence of animal bodies could still be felt. And yet, once in parts and pieces, the animal body could already be, be dissimulated as uniform units of commodification. And so notice the, the hooves on the sidewalk on the, on the photograph to the right. Um, the hooves that once belonged to discrete bodies but are now lined up in this immaculate row with only one slightly off kick, one going off slightly off kilter, um, ruining like the perfect visual, um, the, the, the visual standard, the perfect visual standardization. 
And so the fir this first question is part of the history of animal commodities and, again, would deserve a much longer exposition. The second question, how does animality relate to the advent of the ready-made, is a more complicated art historical question. David Joslitt's astute reading of Duchamp's early works might show the way. Uh, one of his most compelling arguments uncovers a dialectical tension between ontology and language in Duchamp's turn from painting to the ready-made. This would be in the early, in the early teens. Joslitt shows that the human body, especially female flesh and carnality, gets caught up in semiological containment and in doing so enters into the marketplace of signs. This relationship then is between particular singular bodies and the generalizing semiotic and economic codes that constrain them. And yet, crucially enough, visceral carnality can never be completely captured by semiosis. Bodies always haunt language as ontological excess. And from here, a more general set of oppositions unfold, which Joslit finds carry over from Duchamp's cubist portraits which impose machinic regulation on the human body, to the ready-mades themselves, which in turn incarnate both industrial production and carnal residues. And so on the one hand, you have language uh, and or flesh, or generality and singularity, or the digital and the analog, or using Duchamp's own terms, which, which Joslit will use, mensurability, that which can be measured, and immensurability, that, that which cannot. So th this passage in this chapter in Joslit's book uh, this is from Infinite Regress, is very rich, very theoretical, very, very dense and, and difficult, uh, so I can't do it justice here. Um, but, just, but, but in the general terms of the argument, um, the thing to know is that he's saying that the, the transition from painting to the ready-made objects, the human forms that are in the paintings, which are already in some ways uh, hybrid machines, uh, they, they're still in some ways present in the sort of anthropomorphic or elusiveness, the way in which the ready-made objects uh, remain elusive to the human body. So uh, clearly the urinal or the shovel or the bicycle wheel, right? So that's his, his general, uh, general argument. And I, I can't recommend his study enough. I think it's one of the best studies on Duchamp still. And so in this tension between inimitable flesh and machinic interchangeability, Joslit never considers the animal body. But it's uncanny how often he uses the, the, the term visceral, uh, and how well, and, and visceral means guts, right? Uh, it comes from, from guts, our insides, organs, and that sort of thing, um, the, the affective parts of us. And how well the creature leaf fits in his analysis of carnal capture in the marketplace of signs. Flesh and viscera qualify the animal for inclusion on the immeasurable side of his divide. After all, if there's been a body that has had mechanistic qualities imposed onto it, beginning with Cartesian ignominy, uh, going back to Descartes, who, who first articulated the theory of the animal machine, the animal machine, it's non-human animals. It's as if the history of animal sh machines and the eventual violent reduction of non-human life to interchangeable units in factory farms, beginning in the 1950s, is presaged by the violence Joslit finds at the heart of Duchamp's turn to industrial objects and the flesh that haunts them. It is, in fact, in the 1950s that we see one of the first celebrated animal ready-mades in Robert Rauschenberg's monogram, 1955 to, to 9, an early combine featuring an angora goat with a white painted tire wrapped around its belly. The animal is an object, among others, within a matrix of sculptural and painterly meaning, and it's important to note that Rauschenberg's combines represent a major stop along the way of the ready-made as aesthetic deregulation. Now a painting can be displayed on the ground with various non-art objects on top of it. There have been some real tortured arguments in the art historical literature concerning this goat, psychoanalytic interpretations that are relentlessly biographic and read the relationship between the animal and the tire as penetrative and somehow elusive of homosexuality. For this reason, it's been basically missed that the goat and the tire represent altogether different entities, one formerly alive, the other inanimate one in a state of organic decay, the other in an inorganic state of stable bonding, and most crucially, one an embodied residue of a singular form of life, the other a completely interchangeable industrial product. Monogram manifests the ontological differences between creaturely life and the industrial ready-made while recalling the history of animals and the development of the Fordist assembly line to boot. It might be argued that this tire became erratic 
and singular as soon as Rauschenberg painted and used it for one of his combines. And furthermore, that swapping it out for a virtually identical tire would fundamentally alter the work, perhaps. But note how the tire, as a ready-made object, needed to await aesthetic nomination to become unique in this way. The goat never needed this operation. She was always already a singular form of life with the capacity for memory, auto-effective maintenance, and homeostasis. Homeostasis is a biological term for a system that, that maintains itself um, against, against the, the entropic forces of, of what it means to, to live. Uh, kinship, and the ability to respond to a name. Um, and just a small little aside here, it turns out that Rauschenberg, when he was younger, he had a pet goat um, who, I think it was his father who took, who ended up taking the goat away and, and, and took it to slaughter. Uh, Rauschenberg doesn't really talk much about this in relation to the work, but I, you can't help but think that in some ways this goat is haunted by the memory of Rauschenberg's uh, pet goat um, in, in, I think it was in, in Texas. Uh, so this stubborn goat maintains an existential recalcitrance that while caught up in the deregulative history of the ready-made, nonetheless does not fit Duchamp's original instigation of choosing generalizable industrial objects. Even if scientists took DNA samples and cloned the animal, the resulting goat would be ge genetically identical to the first goat, but her cognitive and phenomenological development would take a new and indelible course, resulting in a unique point of life opening onto the world. Um, and when I was younger, I saw the Stephen King, the first version of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, and this is basically the lesson I took from that horror movie: uh, that if the pet if the pet comes back, the pet is not going to be be the same. Um, and I think this is the same thing with all cloning technologies or regenesis um, uh, technologies of people cloning their dog. It's not the same dog that 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 comes back. Uh, this is what Roland Barthes described in a completely other context as the, imp the impossible science of the unique individual, a surplus of singularity that exceeds inter interchangeability without loss, which can no longer be restricted to human animality. Rauschenberg's most famous quote about his practice might strike us now as a compatible sentiment when he declared that, quote, painting relates to both art and life. Neither can be made. I try to act in the gap between the two, end quote. This is an ambiguous and much commented on quote, um, and it, but it's suggestive that Rauschenberg describes art and life, which should include non-human life, to be worldly forms that enter into assemblage, can be mixed and sampled, can be used creatively, but never can be made from scratch. In this way, art and animality inform each other as sites of continual becoming, homeostasis, plasticity, and creativity from which we make ourselves, but do not make ourself. And so there I apologize, I took liberties uh, with a very enigmatic phrasing, but I still kind of like it. Um, the way in which uh, the, 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 the things that we, um, um, we use, the things that, that sort of comprise us as living, as, as, as living beings, uh, we, we do make ourselves in that way, but it's always something that in, in, in some sense is outside of us. Uh, so we don't make it ourselves at the same time. Um, that's sort of what I'm trying to get at with that all too enigmatic phrasing. And don't worry, there won't be too many other sentences in, in this talk. Um, Alfred Barr, the first director of MoMA in New York, declined to acquire Monogram uh, for the collection. He worried that the piece would disintegrate rather soon uh, and be taken over by vermin. His comments betray a certain theriophobia. Uh, therio is animal. Therio is the prefix uh, animal. Um, so a certain theriophobia or fear of creaturely decay. Lucky for the Moderna Musée in Sweden, they acquired Monogram instead, and it now resides in their permanent collection as one of its icons. In a way, Barr was right. Rauschenberg's combines have posed a real challenge to conservators. Recently, the Moderna Musée had to undertake a forensic analysis of the goat to make sure of its taxidermic, uh, taxidermic integrity. The museum even posted a blog about this in 2016 called How is the Goat Getting Along? Um, or How is the Goat Getting On? From the title of this blog, one would think that the goat is still alive. Um, and when looking at the documentary images that they provide of the procedures, one can't help but see the goat as an individual that matters and is treated with respect as an inimitable uh, entity. And again, not simply due to Rauschenberg's colorful brushstrokes on her, on her muzzle, on her face.
It should be noted, however, that the museological care this goat is receiving is due in large part by her having been baptized as art these many decades ago. It may very well be that she receives more care and consideration in death than she ever did in life. Nonetheless, the aesthetic value that has been placed on this goat, which transvalues the animal and offers it posthumous protection, is forever held hostage by a creaturely fragility, vulnerability, and irreplaceability. For if the goat ever had to be replaced, the newly stuffed goat would have to be read as a different delegated performer in death. For every minded creature that perishes becomes an unopenable crypt for eclipsed memories and experiences of a past, time, and place. So everything that, that dies, human and non-human, um, for the most part, uh, contains memories and, and, and life experiences that are, that are uh, extinguished and forever lost within, within, within that body and within, within time. And that's a unique. Uh, that's a, that's a unique thing about um, creaturely existence. Um, though we could talk about AI um, as possibly um, also um, hitting that threshold. Although no less than Leo Steinberg has used the term ready-made for this animal, it's arguable that Rauschenberg's goat is less a ready-made and more an objet trouvé or found object in the surrealist mode. After all, the artist didn't procure the animal from a shelf stocked with seemingly identical stuffed goats, but from a used furniture store in Manhattan as presumably the only Caprine decor element on offer. If this is the case, then we have to jump to 1977 and Jeffrey Valance's humorous, though I think ultimately serious, Blinky the Friendly Hen, to find a project that fully embodies the animal, the animal ready-made in all its contradictions. The, animal, uh, the artist went to the supermarket, picked out a chicken from a pile of frozen bodies in the meat section, and named him Blinky. Um, though incidentally here, there's really no way of knowing the sex of, of the bird. Um, and the little research that I've done is that um, chickens that are, that are um, commodified in, in stores in, in, in the industry, they're, they're a mix of, of, of male and female, and it's really, it's really undecidable. Uh, but for the sake of convenience, I'm going to call Blinky uh, a hen. So then uh, Jeff, um, uh, Jeffrey Valance, he then also bought a plot in the Los Angeles Pet Cemetery and laid him, uh, laid him to rest. And so at MoMA uh, in the library, I've scanned this artist book. He, it, it's a performance, but, but he turned it into an artist book. Uh, and so I can just leaf through it for you a little bit here. It's, it's kind of fun to look at, um, depending on your conception of fun. Uh, so this is the title page. Uh, this, is, this is the cover. This is titled the page, title page, Blinky the Friendly Hen. Um, and there is, you know, there is a way in which this work, is, there's definitely an act, activist, um, an animal activist or animal rights uh, angle to the work. You know, and it's on the dedication page. It says, dedicated to the billions of hens sacrificed each year for our consumption. Um, he also went on Letterman, and you can YouTube this, you can find it. Um, I think it was shortly after this, and talked about this project. And there he talks about the project in kind of more cheeky terms, like he's a little bit more irreverent about it. Um, um, but that might have to do with the pressures of being on a, on a, on a television show. Uh, and it might also have to do with the time period, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so really, this is an artist book. It's a little like um, conceptual art books, like if you know any of the conceptual art books from Ed Rouché, uh, like every, every, every building on the uh, Sunset Strip, that sort of thing. It's really deadpan. And it's just kind of describing what he's done. So here he is at the, the grocery store uh, picking out the bird. He picks out one and he calls him Blinky. He unwraps him, um, takes a picture of him. He drives to the pet cemetery uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, he gives you a view of the cemetery grounds. Then he shows you Blinky. He buys a casket for Blinky uh, with satin and everything. Um, and here's the grave site. And you see the casket with flowers by the gravesite. You see the, the casket being lowered into the ground. There's a grave marker, and I think you can still go visit Blinky uh, if you're if you're in LA. And then he also gives uh, the sort of the ephemera, sort of the, the, the material culture of, of the purchase. So the, what, what Blinky came in, the the receipt, um, the contract for the pet cemetery, a map of the pet cemetery, so that you can go find Blinky. Um, and then just like the expenses and the bizarre thing here, I mean, you know, it's, it's actually a lot like how, uh, li a lot like the, uh, big ag agriculture works in this country and not only in this country, but the cheapest thing was the, was, was the meat, uh, which tells you something about, um, uh, subsidies, 
um, and, and sort of the, 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 the political economy political economy of, of meat. Um, and so that's the back page. So you get to see the, 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 the whole book. Okay, um, so here then we have a ready-made plucked from the store among seemingly identi identical commodified bodies. And if, as Joe Slit has argued, Duchamp's original ready-mades held certain carnal and visceral residues, um, here this point is not figural or metaphoric, but quite literal, even if the bird likely had its viscera extruded for ready-made commercial use. And rather than nominate the bird as art, Valence gave the animal a proper name, which is distinct from generic categories like art or species in its implied individuation. And this part is crucial. The gesture of buying a commodified and standardized body is in keeping with the ready-made as a strategy, but then naming the bird Blinky undercuts everything. By endowing Blinky with the proper name, Valence has, in a way, posthumously endowed the bird with personhood, or at least, if not in a legal sense, the moniker serves to signal the chicken's singularity. This may not endow retroactive protection, uh, but it does disqualify the bird as ready-mateable, since, strictly speaking, the ready-made cannot be a unique entity. The philosopher Jacques Derrida would often note that we never really own our proper names, and that they'll always outlive us. Um, there's always something deathly about, about our names, according to Derrida. And this brings us to another wrinkle in the story. Commonsensically enough, as we go through our lives, we identify with the proper names we've been given since birth, be it Jacques or Blinky. Uh, but if our name is never really us, if it's only a borrowed sign that we ultimately have to give back, then our lives as embodied beings on earth are not reducible to what we have been named. This means that the social individuation this means that social individuation happens in other ways, likely unspoken ways and probably uh, in, many, in many cases, uncommunicable ways, which furthermore are likely shared widely by many non-human creatures. Uh, so, for example, parrots uh, who name each other through specific vocalizations in the wild. Um, and there's a really wonderful film called The Great Silence by Alora, Alora and Calzadilla uh, that talks about, about this, and Puerto Rican parrots um, uh, that have individual calls for each other in, in the wild. So this being the case... When still alive, who was this avian creature before being named Blinky for an art project? In the 1970s, this was likely a silly question, one open to ridicule, and maybe it still is uh, today, though I think things are changing. But, because what we've come to know about the existential capacities of chickens, notably in Lori Marino's work, um, the idea that a chicken can have a personality and respond to a proper name is well established. Chickens are the most understudied avian species, largely to, due to their place in our industrial foodways, which have normalized their abjection and commodification. So as Lori Marino talks about, um, they've been chronically um, underestimated as birds, unlike all sorts of other birds, right? Um, like corvids and parrots, who, are, who, who um, if intelligence means something, uh, which I think it does, uh, they, they reach levels of, of, of primate intelligence. So, uh, but, but chickens have always been under, under, undervalued um, or understudied. Nonetheless, they have episodic memory, facial recognition, forms of communication, empathy, can do simple arithmetic, have variable personalities, um, and the ability to differentiate themselves, differentiate in individuals both within and outside their social groups. All of this has been confirmed by the recent scientific literature. And in this way, this is just a larger meth methodological claim, the discipline of cognitive ethology or animal, animal behavior sciences can offer our historians tools for retroactively reconsidering animals in previous artworks. Um, I've just finished hopefully a book that will, that's going to come out soon, um, a whole book about the artist as ethologist, about artists basically um, working as ethologists. And so as with Rauschenberg's goat, uh, Blinky did not need to become a work of art in order to exceed the status of interchangeable industrial product, nor did he need a proper uh, human name. His creaturely existence, however compromised in industrial conditions, was already doing this from birth. This means that a factory farm of chickens, commonsensically enough really, is ontologically distinct from an assembly line of ready-made non-sentient commodities. These birds can no longer be seen as a mass of undifferentiated bodies, but as a mass of individuated intensities. Whether he knew it or not, Valence uh, pushed the contradictions of the animal ready-made to their limits. 
The next question then becomes, can artists undo these contradictions? Can the animal be unready made? I'd argue that any number of art projects since the 1970s have done this. A seminal example is Carson Haller's and Rosemary Trockel's House for Pigs and People from Documenta 10 in 1997. This installation featured a family of pigs, a mother and her piglets, living in a grassy open air enclosure that could be viewed from inside the venue through a one-way glass. Humans could watch this family like a non-human sitcom, while on their side, the pigs could look at their reflections in the mirror surface of the one-way glass, and evidently they enjoyed, uh, they enjoyed doing so. The mirror setup here is no coincidence. It alludes to the psychologist Gordon Gallup's well-known mirror test, which has been used on any number of non-human animals in order to verify a sense of self, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Um, and you can, go, you can go through the scientific literature and see like, uh, which, which animals have passed the mirror test. Uh, I'm pretty sure pigs have, dolphins, um, uh, primates, elephants. There, there, are, uh, there are animals that have passed. There are animals that you think maybe, oh, they, they would pass, but they haven't passed. Um, but it may very well be, and some philosophers have written about this, uh, that, that it actually may not be a failure on the animal part, the animal's part, but it's a failure inherent to the test itself, which privileges vision, which privileges um, um, all sorts of sort of uh, anthropocentric uh, preconditions. But that's for a whole other conversation. And so in this way, however, briefly, the pigs were able to display their more than thingness to a human public. It should be noted, however, that becoming delegated art performers in a prestigious art exhibition did not extricate them from pr brute property status. This is most fully encapsulated in the story Holler tells of the breeder's wife these pigs were sourced from, who decided to take one of the piglets back in order to eat her for her, the wife's, birthday. Another related example might be um, uh, Christian Meindersmann's artist book Pig 05049 from 2007. It's an artist book uh, that's something of a, a visual reverse engineering of a single pig and all the products made from her body. Uh, and so again, I have parts of the book. I don't have the whole book for you because there are so many different objects. Uh, and you can go to her website and see this book. It's laid out very beautifully and it's, it's very accessible. It's very nice. Uh, but here are just some, some examples to leave through. Uh, cheesecake, gelatin, collagen, uh, same thing with licorice or gummy bears. Um, but then things that might not be as evident, uh, things like a, a, a figurine of a little fawn, uh, sandpaper, uh, a bullet, um, a cigarette, uh, and, and, some, and some soap. Um, so it's, a, again, a very, it's, it's a very beautifully conceptual uh, layout um, uh, book uh, that, you, that you can check out on her website. And so at first it might seem that, that this work simply reinforces the animal ready-made, since each object renders the original animal's body utterly anonymous in its dispersal along a multitude of standardized supply chains. And yet, the very act of consolidating all these varied objects back together into an artist's book retrieves, if only conceptually, what has been irretrievably lost and alienated from a unique self. All these disparate objects have become haunted. After all, the unifying feature of this work is the nameless numbered pig, without which the essential coordinates of the project would really lose any sense. Miru Kim's The Pig That Therefore I Am from 2010 is an altogether different example that reflects a more eco-feminist perspective. The artist mingled, mingled her sapient body uh, with factory farm porcine bodies and photographed the performance. The work elicits a two-way tension. Immersed among swine, her human body becomes imbued with the repetitive abjection of industrial animality, a collapse into a state of pure interchangeability that is unthinkable for human viewers. At the same time, the incarnate association and proximity between Kim's body and the non-human bodies around her, in turn, may lead to an undoing of this repetitive abjection of industrial animality that has been imposed on the pigs themselves. In short, there's an uneasy affinity of cognitive and nerve-ended intensities between human and non-human that challenges any facile fly ontology that sees all things in the world equally as ready-mateable. And all this is just a fancy way of saying that the negative associations of swine impose themselves on her body as she lays there, 
But this is a two-way street because Kim's body, the artist's body, can potentially lend the pigs a certain amount of dignity in their similarity with her own human body. Now, of course, in times of femicide and ecocide, not to mention Asian hate crimes, uh, whatever solidarities can be found between the artist and the pigs remain all too fragile and precarious. Uh, and so this leads to an even bigger point. If Kim is lending her personhood to these pigs or, allow, or allowing it to rub off on them in visual argumentation, it should be stressed that personhood does not necessarily provide automatic protection to those who are already deemed to be persons. Um, and depressing, depressingly enough, I could come up with all sorts of examples of, of human people who have, who, who have personhood who are not treated like persons. Um, and there is an incredible story that came out a few years ago of a, C, a CEO of Foxconn, uh, you know, this l large uh, manufacturing plant um, in China. I think most famously Apple, uh, Apple phones are made there. The CEO um, described his, uh, the, the workers in the factory um, as, as animals, uh, which is a complicated statement. Uh, and, and the way he says it is, uh, um, um, insult, is what was an insult. Uh, but even more uh, interestingly, I guess, uh, he also said that he worked with um, uh, or had conversations with a zookeeper, someone who maintained a zoo, in order to get advice on how to control the human laborers in his factory, right? So there's this sense in which the control of, of, of animals um, in one setting gets transferred onto the control of humans in another setting, in a, in a factory, in a factory setting. Um, and so we, there we have a total collapse of, of, of class and species. Um, and it's just an example of a personhood not necessarily really protecting uh, uh, protecting rights or leading to a, a, a full full dignity, right? So this is a this is a complicated question. And just to conclude, uh, there's a crucial final question that remains. So what sort of individuals are we talking about when we talk about non-human individuals? If in the future the cows, chickens, and pigs that inhabit this paper become legally unmoored from their status as property objects, then what types of persons will these non-humans become? or again, more precisely, always already have been. And what if personhood itself is too one-size-fits-all, making it a ready-made and standardized concept in itself? Will we begin multiplying personhood in concentric circles, or better yet, in a constellation of different creaturely types of personhood? Human personhood, primate personhood, corvid personhood, cephalopod personhood, bovine personhood, and so on. Or should we instead move away from the concept of personhood altogether, as the critical animal studies scholar Manisha Dekka has recently argued in her excellent Animals as Legal Beings, Contesting Anthropocentric Legal Orders. Uh, this just came out, uh, and I'm in the middle of reading it. I'm almost finished with it. Um, hi highly recommended. It's a wonderful book. Um, she's right to contest that personhood as a legal concept is too liberal and humanist, and that we need to move uh, towards a more variegated posthumanist conception of non-human animals untethered from the anthropocentric paradigm of personhood, which has historically been founded on myths of pure individuation, autonomy, and cognitive thresholds. Um, and she also makes the argument, I think it's very compelling, that this idea of personhood founded on, you know, really myths of human autonomy, myths of pure human individuation and cognitive uh, ability um, has reinforced certain imperial, racial, colonialist, colonialist uh, conceptions of, of, of the human. Uh, so when we're talking about personhood and the reframing of personhood, we're not only talking about the relationship between humans and non-humans or humans and nature, but we're also talking about the ways in which personhood has been used and wielded legally um, against certain humans who have been deemed to not fall inside the, 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 the paradigm of, of personhood, right? This leads to a whole other conversation, a big conversation, but a very necessary one. Um, and so in this sense, the category of the ready-made and the concept of personhood, they may both be forms of regulation and measurement, um, even if, as I hope I've shown um, in, in this talk, in this paper, that they send each other into categorical crisis. Okay, uh, this is the, the, the end of, of this, this work in, in progress. Thanks so much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, um, and I look forward to you know, using it as a basis uh, for, for a conversation together um, 
uh, unfortunately not in person, but over, um, over, over Zoom, which we've come to know well. Thanks again.